Welcome to another episode of Off the Menu. I'm your host, Vincent Franchini from Tumblr House, here with an Aquarian, Charles Coulomb. An Aquarian, Charles Coulomb. An Aquarian, Charles Coulomb. You mean to say a man for whom the moon is in the seventh house and Jupiter aligns with Mars? Sadly, for yes. Whom Peace reigns throughout the planets, and love steers the stars. Yeah. You're, 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 so basically, I'm into sort of a, a mystic crystal revelation and the mind's true liberation. Yes, you're in favor of the mind's true liberation, yes. Oh, joy. And you know why this has come up, ladies and gentlemen? Why? 55, you're answering on behalf of them, like the Greek chorus. 55 years ago yesterday was the anniversary of the human be-in in Golden Gate Park in San Francisco, November the 14th, 1967, ladies and gentlemen. Oh, man, oh, man, oh, man, oh, Shevitz. And that was the prequel to the Summer of Love. If you're going to San Francisco, be sure to wear some flowers in your hair. What? I am wearing a paisley tie, ladies and gentlemen, in honor of the counterculture. And I've got my UN pin to show that I'm committed to a better future for all life on the planet. War is harmful to children and other living things. <laughs> that had to come out of the 60s. It did come out of the 60s. And oh, so much more. <laughs> <laughs> yes, indeed. Oh. And, you know, I've got a question to ask you. And, and Vinny, I, I mean this at the bottom of my heart. Here's my question. How many paths must a man walk down before they'll call him a man. What what folk singer is that again? Um, is that well, two of them. One with a good voice. Well, one one was a group with great voices. The other was a single with terrible a terrible voice. He wrote it. How many times must a white dove fly before it can drown in the sand or something? The answer, my friend, is blowing in the wind. The answer. Oh, is that is Bob Dylan then? The yes, Bob Dylan. Yeah. But you know who made it uh, famous? Is, um, I can't. I, I can't sing. A, think of the woman folk singer. Um, Peter, is, Paul, and Mary. Oh, is, oh, okay. The three of them. But for the woman folk, you're thinking of Joan Baez, maybe? I, I think so. I think so. Ah, uh, well, she sang it. Because, you see, back then, there was a whole shift, you know. There's a whole generation with a new explanation. People in motion. People in motion. Yeah. And it was because, I mean, it was like we were in the middle of the Vietnam War and we just come through the Civil Rights Movement and and JFK had died and and later RFK and, and, and Martin would die. And and I mean, yeah, you know what I, I'm saying? It, it was like, and, and there was, because there was like uh, Timothy Leary and, and there there was, uh, it, it was, yeah, yeah, definitely. And, and see, because like, I remember when I was like six years old and like we saw on the TV, um, the human being up there because it was like big stuff. And mind you, we had a lot of hippies in Hollywood then too. Oh yeah. In fact, true story. Uh, I was walking down Sunset Boulevard near Blessed Sacrament on my way back to our home at the Palatial Criswell Mansion. Well, all right, it wasn't a mansion, but it was the Criswell House. Anyhow, I was on my way back home 
and this woman in a long calico dress, obviously inspired by Melanie, came up to me and said, and I quote, you're a beautiful little boy, and I think you should have something beautiful. And she reached into her voluminous dress and pulled out a leather bag tied, you know, pulled tight with a leather string sort of thing. This is for you. And she handed it to me and walked away. When I got home, I opened the bag, emptied it out on my bed. It was filled with seashells, which had been painted and had glitter attached. Well, they were actually kind of pretty in that way. Do you still have those seashells? I do. <laughs> that's very beautiful. Isn't that beautiful? <laughs> that's, see, that's the way it was back then. And it was... I mean, it was a time when there was a coming together, you know, of people from all walks of life. And it was just because, yeah, and, 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 and the music, you know, and, 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 and there, was, there was a feeling of life in the air and, and vibration and change. And people were, were seeking a new, a new paradigm. There was like this whole, whole new experience going on. And, and if you lived through it, but were like 10 or 15 or 20 years older than I was, you've never left it. And like you're trapped. So like if you're in a position of like authority or something in like church or state, you could never like really escape 1968. It's kind of like Hotel California. Yeah, just like that. <laughs> but see, the problem is if you're like not that old, Let's say that you were old enough to be aware of what was going on, but not old enough to really have anything to do with it. You were like, oh, I don't know, a, a little kid going to school. Well, then you just thought your older brother's peers had kind of gone stupid. And, and like, as the years went by, and they made life choices based on, you know, the way things were back then, and you saw the marriages that didn't last with the shack ups and the many confused children that were produced. And now we're talking about the proles. Don't get me started about that generation in power. Well, you mightn't have thought it was so wonderful then. You might have thought it was a horrible crock. Fortunately, that's only what bad people think. I'm a good person, so I think it really was wonderful. That's wonderful, Charles. That makes me happy that you're happy. I, <laughs> yes, it, I'm really happy. I couldn't be happier if I tried. That you know, I remember that wonderful movie, Field of Dreams. You remember that? Yeah, Kevin Costner, yeah. If you build Kevin it, Costner. it will come. That's the one. And they seek out James Earl Jones, who plays a... a uh, uh, J uh, sort of a J.D. Salinger hermit-like figure. And they're trying to, you know, communicate uh, Costner and his wife, who are 60s people, who who feel that the ensuing 20 years, because it's, you know, it was filmed in the 80s, it's like the return of the Seacaucus 7 or the, or the Big Chill, you know, where the, the boomer generation takes a really good look at itself and likes what it sees. Well, it was that kind of thing. So they, they, they seek this guy out and they find him, and even though he's a recluse, and they say to him, they, they explain that they're on a mission, there's this vision and, 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 and all this stuff. And he listens and he says, so basically, you're from the 60s. And they looked at each other and he goes, well, I, yeah, I guess. And he takes this insecticide and goes, go back, get away while you still can, go back. And I, I, I kind of wish they would all do that. You know, if you think that 1969 is where we should all be right now, that's where you should be. And I, I wish I could tell so many people in church and state of a certain age that, you know, it's really time to go home. Woodstock's over. The human being ended. The summer of love. It's all blowing in the wind 
And in fact, when I think of the attempts to restrict the traditional mass and things like that, I have a message for everyone who wants to do that. It's a message written by Bob Dylan. And I can understand there are bishops and other high clerics who are really upset by the fact that so many young people today are rigid and like that stuff that they gave their lives to try to destroy. I understand how they feel. I really do. And because I understand it, I would like to speak to them now in words they will understand. Words that will mean a lot more to them than theological dubia or canon law or even lyrics or even logic or common sense. And here is my message for all of the prelates and Susans of the parish council and all of the members of my generation who find the fascination of the young with Catholic tradition so upsetting. Come mothers and fathers throughout the land and don't criticize what you can't understand. Your sons and your daughters are beyond your command. Your old road is rapidly aging. Please get out of the new one if you can't lend your hand for the times they are a-changing. The line it is drawn, the curse it is cast. The slow one now will later be fast, as the present now will later be past. The order is rapidly fading, and the first one now will later be last. For the times, they are a-changing. And that is my message to everyone in charge in church and state, brought to you with love from the age of Aquarius. Um, that brings me to a question. Do the unique characteristics of the 60s and the people from the 60s, has that shaped how they are handling covid or is it or is how they're how they're handling covid just simply a function of people in power trying to grab as much power as can be no i, I think their sixes experience um did shape them to a great degree in the sense that for a lot of them it made them kind of watery people they don't really have fixed beliefs Hmm. They don't uh, really have, I mean, they've got very little, most of them, in the way of real religion. So for them, death is the worst thing they can be. Hmm. They are, by nature, ahistorical. They reject the past. They reject tradition. So they can't really look back and see how things were done. And they're completely subjective. It really is all about them. They're narcissistic. Uh, and that, too, was very much a product of the 60s. I mean, I've got to be me. I can't just be tied down. Oh, yeah, why not? Why are you so special, smart guy? You're mm -hmm. here to bring the best of what you've inherited and make it useful for those who will succeed you. You're only a steward, my little muffin. You're not an owner. And that's the problem. Hmm. You think you are. It's not all about you. Hmm. As my late father used to say, you know, you can tell if you are irreplaceable and absolutely essential. How? Take a glass of water. Put your finger in it and pull it out. And if there's still a depression where your finger was, you're indispensable. But if the water's got bad to level, you can be replaced. What? What if the <laughs> That's if you stick so your random. Finger, if you stick your finger in the water and you pull it out and there's still a depression in the water where your finger was, then you're absolutely irreplaceable. But if the water's got back to level, then you could be replaced by someone else. Whatever. Try the test yourself. 
get a glass of water, stick your finger in it, pull it out, and if there isn't still a finger-shaped depression in that water, then you can be replaced. What about Jello? Jello is very different. <laughs> And you had to bring that up, didn't you? The, the late 60s, early 70s were the doom of the Jell-O culture. Everything in aspic. You remember that, don't you? I think we've dealt with aspic before on the show. Yeah, go ahead, talk about it. Well, this is more early 60s and 50s. But when I was a kid, one of the things people loved was everything imaginable in aspic which is jello, only savory, not sweet. Let me see if I can find a, an image to share. Oh, yes. <laughs> oh, my heavens, what a load of goodies. <laughs> Such a plethora of things to choose from. <laughs> well, I think we we'll use this. This, if you were going to have any kind of a Fancy lunch. You can feel free to share this with the people. I don't want them to miss out. <laughs> there you go. All right. Let's see. Uh... Okay. We're going <laughs> to do that. This you is. Uh... All right, Charles. I don't know why you're making me subject this to the people. I'm sharing with the bits of my childhood. All right, what you shared is now on the screen. I don't Isn't even know that what delicious? that is. Is that, that, is that... Well, there's egg, there's little bits of meat, vegetables, and so forth. It's gelatin, sliced. And in every bite, you got all of that stuff. Now, if you can imagine this done in like a round donut like thing and in the middle of it some finely chopped oh i don't know tuna and oregano and, and parsley um that was considered quite the thing to serve at uh, fashionable lunches well thank god that's done with ho oh, oh, let me tell you something i've got a good friend i won't mention her name on the air but she's a fellow parishioner at Our Lady of Grace, the Ordinariate Parish in the in the valley, and she is the queen of aspic. I know. Her husband did all of our fine graphics for the show. Uh, absolutely. And she, I'll tell you what, you have dinner at their place, and I guarantee you, your view of aspic will change forever. Oh. <laughs> if you're very good, you may be able to convince her to share some of her uh, some of her recipes with your wife. I don't know if my wife would be into that. You should ask her. It's pretty weird, Charles. Ask her how she stands on the whole aspect issue. Okay. And uh, I'm telling you, you know, when I get home again, whenever that may be, what we could do if your wife has really got into it. We could have like an, you couldn't say an aspic cook-off, really, could you? It's sort of a gel-off, more like it. But at any rate, we could have a thing like this. Maybe get two or three other housewives interested. And then, uh, you know, we'd be the panel of judges. And it'd be great. The great aspic gel-off of 2022. In the uh, words of Cardinal Dolan, uh, let's not. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I got to tell you that uh, the hippies were partially rebelling against Aspect, which is one reason why I favor it now. Because, you know, there was so much that they, uh, mind you, I'm not entirely against them either. I always think of what J.R.R. Tolkien said about the, uh, the, the hippie movement. Now, remember, Tolkien uh, was a very good Catholic, very conservative, literally, with a big C. A very, very conservative fellow, but he was his work was embraced by the counterculture. Uh, the, the hippies are really what made him uh, so big. Yeah. And, you know, he had a hard time understanding his popularity, frankly, among them. But 
he didn't try to understand them. I, I could see that the trees fighting back uh, the, you know, the machinery of industry versus um, more natural approach. I could see that. Yeah, and so could Tolkien. So he had, if I can find it easily, he has a, a quote. Uh, the uh, he has a quote that I I really really think is worth um, worth thinking about uh, because it shows that he understood an element an element of the counterculture. I mean I like to joke about it, and of course the worst things about it uh, are really all around us. But that wasn't all there was. You know that's an important thing to bear in mind. Nothing in history is all one-sided. Yeah, I remember in Puritan's Empire, you said the cult, the counterculture was right in a sense because the, the, the culture yeah. was not great, right? So no, but the diagnosis was uh, the or, but the remedy was worse, right? Yeah, <laughs> the, the diagnosis was correct, but the remedy was worse, and he. Um, uh, he makes the comment. Uh, uh, let me see. Let me see if I can find it easily. If I can't, then we're out of luck. But if I can, then we've got something. Uh, no, that's not it. Uh, the uh, talked about in one of his letters. He goes on about them. Uh, ah, here we go. Uh, he uh, he makes a comment that uh, I think is quite quite correct. Uh, let's see. Here we go. He says uh, there are, of course, um, various elements of the present situation. This is he's writing in 1967, incidentally. There are, of course, various elements of the present situation which are confused, though in fact distinct, as indeed in the behavior of modern uh, youth, part of which is inspired by admirable motives such as anti-regimentation and anti-drabness, a sort of romantic longing for cavaliers, and is not necessarily allied to the drugs or the cults of fainéance and filth. Well... I think that's a fair deal. And out of that, uh, we know this, this is the aspect I could just appeared on my screen. Out of it um, appeared the uh, several things. The love of Tolkien itself, the uh, Mythopaic Society, the Tolkien Society in Britain, and an interest in things like the Renaissance Fair and the Christmas Revels and uh, the Society for Creative Anachronism, were, none of which are necessarily all going the way one all went the way one would like but you see the big problem is and tolkien saw this in his correspondence where at other times like uh, the rise of the romantic movement after the uh, french revolution the period between the wars when similar kinds of questioning came up the church was ready with its answers and so we got a lot of really fine converts and so on the same would have happened in the 60s, except we were busy being stupid. Not that that's a bad thing. Stupid is good. Ask anyone in charge today. But, um, no, had we, had we not been busy destroying everything we stood for, uh, one can only imagine what those impulses would have ended up as. Instead, we didn't, and so they just went to tearing apart what was good about what we had and um, adding new evils to replace the old ones. Hmm. Yeah. So that's unfortunate. But in happier news also, uh, one should remember that we're getting closer to the 21st of January. And the 21st is the anniversary of the murder of Louis XVI. 
and masses are being offered for the repose of his soul in France and many other countries. Although in Strasbourg, the bishop just ordered the uh, mass canceled uh, because, of course, it was going to be Tridentine. And he invoked uh, custodians of the trash can or whatever it's called. Um, in doing custodians so. Custodians of the trash can? What? Yeah. What? Why? Is that what it's called? Yeah, custodians of the trash can. Yep. Well, they want to trash it, right? And they're the custodians. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Yeah. I wish they worked as hard as most custodians I've known, but never mind. Um, of course, most custodians I know don't have grinder. And Eddie, will you stop that? Anyhow, as I was saying, uh, so instead, that mass in Strasbourg is going to be said in the SSPX church in Strasbourg. I'm sure something similar will happen in other places. Um, you know, it's times like this I really loathe those people. I really do. It's it's very difficult. One has to remember that the devil wants us to hate them. If he can take us to hell for hating them, whom he already has, unless they repent before they croak. It's a double, it's a win-win for him. So we've got to try not to. Anywho, uh, having said all of that, that's on the 21st. On the 28th is the feast, my name day, Blessed Charlemagne, which will be celebrated with due pomp in uh, both Aachen and Frankfurt. And then, on the 30th, is the death day of Charles I of England. And his uh, Anglican devotees will be having masses in his honor. His Catholic devotees will be having masses for his, the repose of his soul and uh, praying that he performs some miracle or other. And then, the 31st is the... Uh, anniversary of the death of Bonnie Prince Charlie. But it's also the night before St. Bridget's Day, February the 1st. And February the 1st is Candlemas Eve. And February 2nd is Candlemas. Candlemas Eve, you've got to take down the last of the decorations. Keep them up until then. Last of the Christmas decorations. It's the end of the Christmas season, as such. Although, in a sense, it continues on to Mardi Gras. So you want to replace it with Mardi February Gras. February second's Groundhog Day too. Yeah, it's Groundhog Day. <laughs> yeah, Pugsatawney Phil and his various uh, various rivals and uh, and. Uh, <laughs> His rivals. Well, he has rivals. There are other towns that have uh, that have groundhogs that they rely on. And then, uh, let me see. Then February the third is Saint Blaise Day, with the throat blessings. And that, to me, is really kind of the end, in one sense, of the season, even after Candlemas. But you know, I don't like that and go of it. I do not like that and go of Christmas. I've still got my Christmas tree up. Well, more than I do. We had the defenestration uh, last week. Thing went out the window. Yeah, my wife won't let me take it out yet. And it's still pretty, very green, so. Yeah, well, that's fine. I mean, look, if if you can keep it up, by all means do. Yeah. yeah. I, uh, I love to think of the... Uh, well, I mean, Christmas is just my favorite time of year. There's, there's no way around it. Yeah. Even though I'm I'm freer to be myself on Halloween and April Fools. Yeah, we know that. <laughs> <laughs> All right, questions time. All right. All right, we have a great question from French guy number one. Uh, okay. He says, "Happy New Year to the Prince of Publishers, His Royal Highness Vincent, and of course the Czar of the Bazaar, His Imperial <laughs> Highness Charles." 
I decided to be environmentally conscious and recycle some titles as I searched the depths of my dictionary looking for new ones. Wow, that's that you know, I grok. I grok. That's yeah. This guy, you know, he's really in tune. That's cool, man. That's really cool. That's great. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right. So he says, I present two questions which I hope the czar will answer. The czar, the czar. I like that. <laughs> Firstly, Mary Baker Eddy in Christian Science, Ellen G. White in Seventh Day Ad Adventism, Charles Taze Russell in Jehovah's Witnesses, Joseph Smith in Mormonism, Spiritualism and the Germanic Neo Paganism, which would one day influence the Nazis. All of these movements and their leaders began in the 1800s. What made the 19th century such a golden age for weirdos and bizarre new religious movements and cults? It doesn't seem that any other century has seen the same rapid growth of new movements. What was it about the 19th century that made that time such fertile ground for them? Great question. Well, sorry? I said great question, French guy number it, one. It is a great question. And a, uh, I mean, a particularly great question. One I, I enjoy, get to enjoy answering, frankly. <laughs> Basically, the 19th century was a period when a lot of things came together. Uh, for starters, both in America and Europe, you would have the, the great revolutions. And to these were added the Industrial Revolution. And then you had more revolutions in 1848 and all that. So a lot, on the one hand, and you had the aftermath of the Enlightenment, you had the growth of science as well as industry. And so a lot of different things were in the air of fighting for men's minds. On the one hand, there were the old beliefs in religion and the old beliefs in conservatism uh, in government. And this led to a rise uh it led to the rise of romanticism. It led to the various Catholic revivals. It led to uh, the birth of conservatism as a real thing. But of course, it also led to the other. It, it led to the opposite. It led to the rise of secularism, atheism, scientificism, Marxism, socialism. I mean, all this stuff blew up at once. And it's interesting that you had several different things going on at the same time in America, echoing in Europe, and in Europe sometimes echoed was in America. Literarily, you had the rise of the Gothic novel and the birth of fantasy and uh, science fiction uh, and horror. These were all born during the 19th century. Um, and they the uh, in in religion in America, you had the rise because the frontier was settled. With all this other stuff going on in the cities, the frontier is settled, and you have a whole new world uh, rising. You've got the revival movement and the uh, the great uh, the great awakenings. You know there were three of them. Uh, so you have these you have these revivals. You've got spiritualism, the idea that perhaps there's a, a scientific way to communicate with the dead. We can do all sorts of other things to inventions. Um, I mean, it, it was just the clash of ideas, modes of thought, etc. And for the first time, we became a truly global civilization. So the ideas of China, Japan, India really came into the uh, intellectual matrix in a way they never had before. I mean, before, the, in the 18th century, the East influenced us artistically. But there were not sufficient number of people familiar with the religious and philosophical texts of those eras. Well, that changed in the 19th century. It had a big effect on what we call transcendentalism in the United States. Uh, but, I mean, it, it was the reason why you had all those, these weird religions arise is because you had so many things going on. Uh, for a lot of people, the old truths didn't seem real anymore, so they wanted something new to hold on to. For other people, they really held on to the old truths in the face of all this change of bizarrety. So 
it, it was really an exciting time. But in with it under that, it's also important to bear in mind that the United States have always had a track record for creating strange cults. Uh, and this, I think, is partly because of the nature, the religious nature, of the people who emigrated to our country. They were generally religious rejects. So originally, New England was the cradle of weird religion in America, where the Puritans settled. I mean, that was where the Unitarians arose, of course. But you had the witch cult at Salem, the new light cult of Shadrach, Ireland, the Shakers, you know, I mean, just a lot of weird folks. Even Mormonism comes out of that milieu originally. Yankee crazy. Uh, from there, and, and it's no, no shock that spiritualism started in upstate New York in an area heavily settled by New Englanders. However, after the Civil War, the, uh, and Christian science uh, that you mentioned rose, of course, in Massachusetts. But after the Civil War, the focus of crazy moved from New England to the Midwest. And then you started to get new thought, the Unity School, all this kind of stuff. It really went wild. And then along about 1890 or so, it shifted again. And the center of weird religiosity in the United States moved from the Midwest to Southern California. And it got really, really wild, and has remained so ever since. Uh, back in 2002 or three, I wrote an article for um, uh, the New Oxford Review called No Sane City, in which I described some of the cults of my childhood in LA. And we had a lot of them, and still do. I mean, gosh, where do you begin? The Lemurian Fellowship, uh, the Great I Am, Mankind United. Uh, in fact, if I can find it quickly, one of the uh, one of the funniest quotes from a book called um, um, Oh heavens, what's the guy's name? Uh, they made a movie. The Day of the Locust is the name of the of the Nathaniel West novel. Nathaniel West. I don't know. Yeah, I read that in high school. Yeah, we read Day of the Locust. There's a quote from it, which um, is really worth, uh, really worth uh, repeating. Uh, he's got one of his uh, one of his characters, uh, his protagonist in Day of the Locust, goes on like a religious quest. And it says his protagonist visits, quote, the Church of Christ physical, where holiness was attained through the constant use of chest weights and spring grips. The Church invisible, where fortunes were told of the dead made to find lost objects. The tabernacle of the third coming, where a woman in male clothing preached the crusade against salt. And the temple modern, under whose glass and chromium roof Brain breathing, the secret of the Aztecs was taught. Pretty weird. Yeah, I'll say. So, uh, and the other thing, too, is that although later this sort of thing would spread to Europe, America, by the mid 19th century, had a big reputation as the birthplace of weird cults, which is why uh, uh, Sir Arthur Conan Doyle use the Mormons in uh, his novel, A Study in Scotland. Hmm. Um, it became sort of a, uh, a trope, not to say a cliche, of uh, mid-century European writing to have, and, and a bit later, to have the American character belonging to some weird religion. Hmm. It's interesting. Did um, it's interesting that uh, I mean, so what was it about America? Like South America was being discovered and developed as well, but it didn't happen down there as much. Well, not as much, uh, but it was Catholic back yeah. then. Yeah, 
Uh, where you did, however, in Brazil, you had the, the influence of spiritualism or spiritism, as it was called, particularly from the French. You had positivism from Auguste Comte amongst the educated. And then, of course, uh, you had a lot of sort of syncretism uh, in parts of Latin America that had large black populations, Santeria, Voodoo, Obea, uh, which, you know, Catholicism sort of shaded off into black magic. Hmm. So that that was, you know, a very different thing uh, to what we were doing. Yeah. Uh, French guy has a follow up. He says, could Charles talk a bit about Charles Marat? Whenever he has been mentioned on the show previously, it's usually been in the context of a much broader subject. What was his background? Where did he come from? How did he grow to be so popular? Also, it strikes me as odd that Accent Francais was in its beginning an Orleanist group. It seems counterintuitive that with the AF's staunch Catholicism and traditionalism, that they would support the claims of the more liberal dynasty. What was the reason for this? Well, that's a good question. Uh, Maras himself uh, came from a, uh, an upper middle class family. He lost the faith very early, as was typical in those days. He was Provençal. Uh, and very much uh, a lover of Provence, and as a result, not just of France, but of the French regions. And that's very important to bear in mind uh, for reasons I'll, I'll make clear momentarily. Um, he was originally more of a left winger than a right winger, but what kind of altered him was the uh, uh, furor over the Dreyfus affair. He was a great lover of France, as I say, and very much he called his he called his uh, doctrine, if you will, integral nationalism. And so he was of the opinion that the Republic and Freemasonry and anti-Catholicism destroyed what uh, the Church and the monarchy had built. So at this stage of his life, he's not a believer, but he loves France. France is everything for him. And he considers that the church is important because she incarnates the spirit of France and did so much to build France up. And of course, the vast majority of his collaborators will be believing Catholics, although he himself is not. Uh, very much a literateur, very much into uh, the idea of the Latin civilization of which France then he felt was the foremost exponent. Um, he converted to monarchy. Now, the monarchists in France themselves had had kind of an interesting setup going. Originally, as you recall, the House of Orléans had uh, betrayed the king. Philippe Galité had voted for uh, Louis XVI's death. His son, Louis Philippe, was reconciled with Louis XVIII, but then betrayed Charles X and became king of the French himself. He was then overthrown, uh, and you had two claimants. Charles X's grandson, Henry V, the Comte de Chambord, and then the descendants of Louis Philippe, who were called the Dukes of Orléans. Um, when Henri V died uh, in 1883, he had reconciled with Louis Philippe's son and grandson, who in any case was much more conservative than his father had been. Uh, and so most French royalists, most French legitimists, accepted the Orléans as the heirs of Chambord. A few did not, but of course the next senior member of the House of Bourbon was in fact the uh, Spanish Carlist. And for a very, at the time, small number of French royalists, the so-called Blancs de España, the Whites of Spain, uh, the Carlist king was the rightful king of France as well as of Spain. So, Moras starts writing, he creates this doctrine of integral nationalism, uh, he looks into how the monarchy made France great and why it was essential to France's greatness 
for the monarchy to be restored. Because he is, as I say, very provincial, he believes that the monarch should, on the one hand, really concentrate on foreign affairs and defense, with the provinces, to a great degree, left to look after themselves, i.e. subsidiarity, we would say today, provincial rights. Um, and he was a very fine writer, so he influenced a lot of people, not just in France, but in Belgium, Spain, Portugal, Austria, uh, Quebec, Louisiana, Italy. He got very, very big. Um, then came World War I. Um, now, one of the things that I didn't mention was the Third Republic was very anti-clerical. Uh, after World War I, the uh, Black Star Francaise uh, lost certain members who felt that Maras was not activist enough. And a moment of uh, particular difficulty came in 1934 when a number of right-wing groups were in a position to possibly overthrow the government and take power. Because the question is always, how are we going to bring back the king? And uh, Boras had always said, when the moment is right, we'll strike. This particular moment appeared to have arrived in 1934, and they did not take advantage of it. So he lost a certain number of followers. Uh, then in 1936, well, one thing I, I neglected to mention uh, was that Maras, as I say, himself was not a believer. And his view of the necessity of the church for France was based upon its utility for France. Uh, Pius XI was convinced by his Secretary of State to condemn L'Action Française in 1926 to put Maras's works on the index and to excommunicate those who would not leave it. This was a big deal. It was uh, very much like the Rallyement that Leo XIII had put the French royalists through in the 1880s. And in fact, a cardinal gave up his red hat because of it, Cardinal Louis Bio, Louis Cardinal Bio. It's interesting that one of the very first things that uh, Pius XII did when he, when he became Pope was to lift the ban on L'Action Francaise. Um, the, uh, then the war with Germany came. They'd always been very anti-German. Uh, so he encouraged the fight. Um, France lost. Marshal Pétain became the uh, leader of Vichy. And in the beginning, appointed a number of L'Action Francaise and L'Action Francaise allied people to help in what was called the National Revolution, the Revolution Nationale. It being the idea of Marshal Pétain that France had been the reason why the Germans were able to defeat the French, in his view, and that of many other people, including Lassau Francais, was that France had been hollowed out from the inside. And so what was required was taking this defeat as a chance to rebuild France from the beginning so that she could once again be a great power. Well, that appealed, of course, to Lassau Francais, and uh, Maras got on all right with Pétain. But as time went on, Pétain was more and more pressured to freeze out from his government the uh, Catholic element and the traditionalist royalist element and replace them with socialists like Pierre Laval, who were much more pro-German. In 1942, the United States and Britain attacked French North Africa uh, and seized it. And in response, the Germans occupied Vichy, France. So uh, Pétain was taken prisoner by the Germans and put in prison in Germany. And Maras kind of sat on the sidelines until the war ended. He was tried as being a collaborator with Vichy. Uh, he was pardoned. And he converted to the faith before he died, a couple of years before he died.
I think he died in 52 or something like that. So that was the end of uh, Chamorras, but the uh, L'Action Francaise continued to this present day. Now, as regards why they would continue to support the House of Orléans, it's purely because they're French. In the eyes of Morras, the problem with the older line of the French uh, dynasty is that they were no longer French, they're Spanish. Now, several interesting things happened in that regard. One was that the Carlos line died out. Now, the next senior line were the current reigning kings of Spain. But one of the things that was also pointed out is that when uh, Louis XIV's grandson became king of Spain, he signed a treaty renouncing for his descendants the throne of France. The idea, however, being that the king of France should never be king of Spain. What everybody wanted to prevent were the two countries being united. So, interestingly enough, uh, Alfonso XIII, the last reigning king of Spain until 1976, um, had two sons. His oldest son, Don Jaime, was uh, blind and deaf, like the fellow in uh, in The Who, you know, uh, Tommy. That uh, deaf, dumb, and blind kid sure plays a mean game of pinball. Hmm. So, as a result, uh, King Alfonso got his oldest son to renounce the throne of Spain. The claims to which would go to his son, Don Juan, and eventually to Juan Carlos, who was king until recently. He did not ask him to renounce his claim to the throne of France. His son, also called Alfonso, began to press it in the 1980s. There were very few legitimists until that time in France. But what happened was that the then Count of Paris did a number of things that have really annoyed a number of his followers. Um, many of whom had been members of L'Action Francaise, which is to this day Orléanese. Um, but it was the combination of Alfonso's pursuit of it and the malfeasances as seen uh, of the Count of Paris that created the modern legitimist movement. Um, and now uh, the Count of Paris's grandson also called the Count of Paris, uh, Jean, who was the Duc de Vendôme while his father was still alive, uh, is the heir to the Orléanist claim and recognized by L'Action Française as the King of France. Whereas Don Alfonso, who was beheaded in 1989 by accident, skiing accident, he was, went down the slope, went through a um, cable, Oh, sliced his head off. So uh, his son became the Duc d'Anjou, uh, de Jure Louis the Twentieth. So that's basically why L'Action Française are that way, because uh, Maurras could not conceive of a, of a quote unquote foreigner holding the throne of France. Although um, Louis would say that. Uh, you know, he, he didn't cease being French just by virtue of being uh, born in Spain. So, the, you know, both sides will show you all sorts of arguments as to which, you know, I'm a legitimist myself, but I certainly have no animus toward the Orleanese and certainly none toward L'Action Francaise. Okay. Oh, one thing I should mention. Like I told you they had influence in Quebec. Well, one of the greatest uh, historians and political thinkers Quebec ever produced, Père or Monseigneur Lionel Grou, who's a French pre a French Canadian priest, formed L'Action Française Canadienne. His devotees in New England put out a uh, magazine or a newspaper called La Sentinelle. And that was at the center of the great Sentinelist problem in the 1920s. So you see, Monas reached out even to New England. I see. You happy about that? Uh, yeah. Bored? 
Yeah, I, I think I think we've had enough French stuff for the episode. Yeah. Did I mention that the great uh, Louisiana historian Alcé Fortier was the representative of Lexion Française in New Orleans? Did I mention that? Fascinating. Did I mention that French is spoken in northwestern Italy, around the place called uh, the Val d'Autun, Austa? I'm not from northwestern Italy. Yeah, well, it's uh, they speak French up there. It's right south of French-speaking Switzerland, which is called La Suisse Romande. And also southern Belgium speaks French, the Wallonie. Not... Uh, well... I bet you feel good about that now. <laughs> All right, next question from Youssef, who says, what was the Orthodox Church's reaction, if any, to the Protestant Reformation and Enlightenment in the West? Well, quite a bit. Believe it or not, uh, there were um, attempts by various Protestants first to make contact, sort of a pan-anti-Roman thing with the Orthodox. And that had a certain amount of success in terms, uh, I believe his name was Mogila, in terms of getting uh, one of the hierarchs to put out a semi-Calvinist uh, catechism. But eventually that was frowned upon. Although there are in Ukraine and other areas, Lutherans of the Byzantine Rite. Hmm. Pretty weird, huh? Pretty weird. But by and large, um, they considered uh, Protestantism a corruption of Catholicism, which in turn they consider a corruption of Orthodoxy. I see. All right. Andrew from New Jersey has a, a question for us. He says, hello, gentlemen, and greetings from the Garden State. Parana Small. I'm happy to announce that we managed to escape our predicament from last week. The Monophysites were all completely wiped out by the Ramapo Mountain Balrog. It was touch and go for a while, but it all worked out. The Balrog is actually a pretty nice guy. I mean, sure, he's a creature of shadow and flame and appears to be a demon from the ninth circle of hell, but he's really just misunderstood. I and believe you, that. And you'll never believe this, but he's a fan of the show. Now that I certainly believe. <laughs> We had a good laugh about that. Anyway, here's my question. What's the deal with the British royal family and the Church of England with divorce? First, you have Henry VIII, who goes as far as to leave Rome, create his own religion with himself as the head, ushers in an extremely bloody period in history, and why? So he can divorce Catherine. But then Edward VIII has to abdicate the throne because he wants to marry the divorcee Wallace Simpson. But then Prince Charles is fine to divorce Diana Spencer and remarry the Duchess of Cornwall, who herself is a divorcee as well. So what's the deal here? Help me understand this. Well, it's like this. First, you've got to remember that Henry VIII never tried to get a divorce from Catherine, but an annulment. And his call for an annulment was based on the fact that she had been uh, affianced to his older brother. They had gotten a papal dispensation to marry because the older brother died. Um, and so it required a papal dispensation in the first place. Uh, he said that, there, that uh, his brother Arthur and Catherine's marriage had been consummated. Uh, Catherine said it had not been. Um, and that the original dispensation was good. Henry argued it was not. Uh, Rome found in favor of Catherine. And so Henry broke off and set up his own, his own deal uh, and declared that his marriage to Catherine was null and had never been valid. When, uh, what's his name? Uh, When uh, he married Anne Boleyn, he claimed that was his first marriage. Now, Anne Boleyn was, um, he believed, uh, guilty of uh, adultery and witchcraft and so on. So she got a, a fair trial and was executed afterwards uh, for all of her crimes. And, of course, after she was executed, he was free to marry again. 
His third wife died in childbirth, Jane Seymour. Uh, his fourth wife, uh, Anne, of Tree, Anne of Cleves, uh, he didn't like the look of. She was kind of a mail order bride. So we never even consummated that one. Then there was Jane, uh, another Jane, who she committed adultery, so he had her executed. And then his last wife was Catherine Parr. So he never actually accepted divorce in the Church of England. And the law of the Church of England remained the same as that of the Catholic Church. All right, fast forward. Edward VIII becomes king, and he is interested in a divorced woman, twice divorced with both husbands still alive. Well, this presents a problem. How can he be the head of the Church of England and, and married to a divorcee when the Church of England, like the Church of Rome, forbids divorce? How does he, how does he do it? Well, there were several possibilities offered, one of them being a Morganatic marriage, which would have made the way out of the difficulty. She would, Mrs. Simpson would never have been queen. Uh, but they didn't go that route, so he stepped out. By the time Charles came along, he was in a very different position. His wife had died, so he was free to marry. Uh, now, bear in mind that the, the British royal family are members of the Church of Scotland, which permits divorce, as well as members of the Church of England, which does not. Uh, putatively. So, uh, Camilla Parker Bowles' first marriage was to a Catholic uh, who got an annulment. So, by our law, Charles and Camilla were free to marry, but not by the law of the Church of England. So, they got married in the Church of Scotland, which permits divorce. So now you know. Okay. Is that non-French enough for you? Definitely non-French enough. Definitely in a better... The show just took a, a better trajectory right now. Oh, did it? Yeah. Would you like to hear a little bit about the history of the French province of Auvergne? No. Are All you right. sure? I'm 100% sure. Provence? No. Bretagne, Artois, Picardy, <sighs> Normandy, Lille de France, Olyonne, Saint-Orge, Angoumois. I can, I can go to the history of any of these places for it. Languedoc, Dauphiné, Lyonne, Niverne, <laughs> Guyenne, Gascogne. Uh, no, thank you. We're good. All right. All right. All right. Lorraine. Lorraine. All right. Question from Scient Cal, who says, Greetings, gentlemen. Well, Could Charles please explain the history of the old Catholic Church, how it separated from Rome, and why it did so? Furthermore, are there grievances with the Holy See at all comparable to the issues that traditional Catholics have with Rome today? Well, it began in France. Let me explain how France was in those days in great detail. <laughs> <laughs> Are you serious? It... No. <laughs> oh, okay, good. <laughs> no, no. France does have a very slight uh, point in it, but it's actually the Netherlands oh, that's the biggest okay. part of the story. But you know, I, I I just feel like torturing. That's all. Oh, okay. All right. As long as we're 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 good on that. Yeah. Or or I could talk about the history of the province of Bourbonne. No. Okay. Do what the man say. All right. All right. Poitou. <laughs> all right. If you don't want to hear about Poitou, we won't talk about it. Fine. 
Anyway, as I was saying before I was interrupted by the itinerant French uh, provincial historian, uh, the uh, it's kind of a, a, a weird tale and rather complex, so I'll, I'll try to keep it simple. Basically, you remember the Jansenists who were condemned. Yeah. Uh, um, they kind of found refuge in the Church of the Netherlands. Now, the Church of the Netherlands had three bishops in Amsterdam, Harlem, and uh, gosh, Utrecht, of course, the Archbishop of Utrecht. But uh, the church in the Netherlands was, of course, disrupted by the Protestant Reformation. It's a small minority. And that's that minority split over Jansenism. And the chapter at Utrecht was pro-Jansenist. Well, they uh, had a problem because they they had uh, no bishops, and the Vatican refused to authorize one of their number because of their adherence to Jansenism. At that point, a missionary bishop, a French missionary bishop coming back from uh, the Near East, stopped in the Netherlands. And they asked him to consecrate bishops, which he did. This is about 1723, I think. And that was the beginning of what was called at the time the Little Church of Utrecht. And they went on with the Mass in, in Latin, clerical celibacy, all that stuff. They continued it. And whenever a uh, one of their bishops would die, the chapter would elect a new one. And they would notify Rome, who would immediately remind them they were excommunicated. <laughs> and so it went for a decade after decade. All right. Then you have 1870 come along in Vatican I. And the church uh, decides to uh, uh, define infallibility. But in Germany, Switzerland, Austria-Hungary, Small groups of uh, priests and lay people decide they're not going to accept the doctrine of infallibility. So they decide to set up their own church, which will be protesting against this innovation. And so they call themselves the Old Catholics. And they link up with the little church of Utrecht, who provides bishops, consecrates bishops for Germany, Austria, Switzerland. Um, and that is the origin of the old Catholic Church we know today. Now, valid orders. So what happens? They begin consecrating bishops uh, to groups that approach them who are fighting against, quote-unquote, papal tyranny. Uh, and so the results of the birth of the Polish National Catholic Church in America and Poland um, and then they, they consecrate a man named Arnold Harris Matthew to lead the old Catholic Church in the British Isles. Well, he's not the most stable person and certainly not the best judge of character. So he consecrates a couple of coadjutor bishops. And then he notices, after having previously signed off on it, that a number of his uh, priests... Uh, had joined the Theosophical Society and was sort of mixing Catholicism and Theosophy. Well, he didn't think this was a good idea, so he told them, stop it. You've got to choose between Theosophy or me. They chose Theosophy. And his coadjutor bishop consecrated two of them as bishops. And from all of that emerges what was called and is still called the Liberal Catholic Church officially. Well, in the meantime, World War Two, uh, World War I was dawning, so uh, he had a, uh, a coadjutor bishop who was an Austrian called uh, the Prince Delandesberg at Roche, and he had consecrated him bishop, but Delandesberg uh, in 1914, when the war broke out, immediately became an enemy alien in Britain. So he went to the United States. 
and there he consecrated two men as bishops, Carfora and brothers, who very shortly broke up with each other and began consecrating bishops. And that was one of the major sources for what are called the Episcopi Fagantes. Now, the old Catholic churches in Europe, uh, Netherlands, Germany, Switzerland, and Austria, and the Polish National Catholic Church in the United States formed what was called the Union of Utrecht. But in 19, in 2000 or something like that, one thing I should tell you is that the old Catholics, although claiming to reject the innovation of, uh, of papal infallibility, got rid of Latin in the Mass, got rid of clerical celibacy, gave up the Council of Trent, they got rid of all that. So in getting, in seeking to, again, to fight a single innovation, they accepted all kinds of others. They crowned this in, I think, 2002 by accepting the ordination of women as priests and bishops. So the Polish National Catholic Church wouldn't do that. They broke with the Union of Utrecht and sort of sponsored small groups in Europe in Scandinavia and Germany and so on, and uh, formed what they called the Union of Scranton, signed in their headquarters in Scranton, Pennsylvania, uh, which encompasses the uh, Polish nationals and these small groups in Europe. So that's where the old Catholics come from. Is there anything in common with trans today? No. Hmm. All right. Uh, William says, are there any specific examples of liturgies that were less than 200 years old that were suppressed at the Council of Trent? Were such lit liturgies all heretical? Well, they were, they were mostly diocesan uses. I don't know about heretical, but the thing was that they were very elaborate. So... Uh, they had various tropes, which are a trope is, a, is an addition to a liturgical text. So a good example from actually the new mass, you know how we have the Kyrie eleison, right? Yeah. Christ, is, uh, Christ uh, 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 Lord have mercy on us, Lord have mercy on us, Christ have mercy, Christ have mercy, yeah. so on. Well, you know how they've got one version of it that goes, um, Lord have mercy, Lord you were sent to heal the contrite. Lord have mercy, you know, Lord save us from our stupid selves or whatever it is. You know what I'm saying? These old liturgies had that? Yeah. What they call they call these liturgical tropes. Okay. And then uh you know what a sequence is, like the Dies Irae or the uh the one at Easter, uh, Vic, uh, uh Victime Pascali Laudes, I think it's called. They're long Latin chants for the particular. They come in uh, during the readings between the uh, Old Testament reading and the uh, Gospel. I mean, sorry, between the Epistle and the Gospel. Um, and they have to do with the actual feast day. There's one for Pentecost, there's one for Easter, okay. etc. And the Dia Zirae for uh, Requiems. Well, they had a lot more of those. Lots and lots of them. Uh, for many different feasts in very in various places. And these had proliferated in the period before Trent. So a lot of, of dioceses that had their own special uses had all sorts of sequences honoring their particular saints. There's stuff like that. I see. Uh, you know, as to what was heretical and what wasn't, I'd have to have a better knowledge, and I know. All right. Uh, our final question for today is from Alex, who says, Happy Epiphany Tide to you. Does, Yay! Does Charles know of any meat dishes that are traditional to eat during Epiphany Tide or at another point in January? And if so, would he please tell us? I do not. But I can recommend some places for you to look. Uh, Evelyn Berger Witz's book, A, a um, Continual Feast, uh, Anne Ball's Catholic Traditions in Cooking, 
uh, I forget the name of the authoress, but the title is the Cooking with Cooking uh, with Christ Handbook, uh, and Helen McLaughlin's uh, Christmas to Candlemas in the Catholic Home. Wow, are these old books? I haven't seen any of these. Yeah, they're old books. Oh. Well, actually, uh, ish. I mean, Vitz and Ball came out in the nineteen late eighties, early nineties. And the others are in the fifties. Oh, okay. Huh. Interesting. Those I, might be online the then. Oh yeah, a number of them are. I'll tell you what, after the show I'll send you a ton of this stuff. Okay. All right, very good. All right. All right, Charles, any closing thoughts? Yeah. This is the beginning of the Kaiser Carl Centennial Year. And uh, this month, of course, shows us the epiphany and uh, the deaths of, of uh, Louis XVI, Charlemagne, and uh, Charles I. There are a lot of other royal saints. Uh, in fact, if you want, some, want something fun to do, look up royal saints on Wikipedia. You get a huge list of them. And then look up each and every one of them. Pray particularly this year to Blessed Carl and all of these other saints that we begin to get decent leadership in church and state. That, honestly, ladies and gentlemen, if you were to point out the one thing that we're really lacking and why we are where we are, it's because of bad leadership, poor leadership, non-leadership. And of course, you could make the argument, and I certainly would not dispute it, that we have the kind of leadership that we deserve. That's probably not untrue. But it won't get better unless we pray for it. And we can't pray for what we don't know. So study these sorts of people. See how leaders should be. Uh, you know, a true king is willing to die for his people. That's the mark, you see. Carl had it. His uh, wife Zita had it. Uh, this is what you look for. You know, I, I um, there were a couple of a uh, couple of uh, bon mots that came to me recently. One of them, I think, I said on the show a few episodes ago. But it's uh, uh, a country without a monarchy. Uh, I should say, without an effective monarchy, is like an orphanage run by bullies. Well, I uh, came up with another one just today in response to a friend of mine on Twitter um, talking about constitutional monarchy where the politicians basically tell the king or the queen what to do. And they, in the name of democracy, have to do it. So my comment was that's rather like a setup where the farmer is advised how to run the hen house by the foxes. Wow. And that's the situation we have, ladies and gentlemen. If we're in a republic, we vote for the foxes. Whichever pack of foxes we want. If we live in a constitutional monarchy, then in our name, the foxes tell the farmer how to run the hen house. And we are accordingly dealt with by our fox leaders. So, pray to all the royal saints and to Christ the King that we be liberated, freed, and that we be worthy to be freed, to be liberated. That he and all of these others he, Christ the King, and all of these other saints help us become the kind of people who deserve heroic leadership, who deserve not to be ruled by moronic swine. Hmm. I'm not saying moronic swine are bad. I just don't think they should be running the show. Yep. As a fellow once said, we'll be ruled by a king when we're a kingly people. Am I right, Charles? 
That's right, Arthur Miller of Vandenbroek. <laughs> well, he said, he said we cease to be uh, ruled by kings when we cease to be a kingly people. Yeah, well, that thing. You, I always like to flip it around. Well, and, and you know, it does make me think of an important thing, really. Okay. It makes me think, I mean, it says in the Bible, where there is no vision, the people perish. And you know, 55 years ago today, or yesterday, there, there was a new vision born. A new vision of how life could be. And you know what? We're living out that vision now. Maybe it wasn't such a good idea. I actually had a, uh, thinking along these lines, I had an interview with a fictional hippie high priestess, universally considered to have been one of the major forces, intellectual forces in the counterculture of the 60s. As I say, it's a fictional person. I made her up. But uh, Daisy, that being her assumed name, uh, when asked, well, Daisy, would you say that you and the counterculture have achieved everything you wanted to achieve in society? Oh, yeah, man. It's really out of sight. It's just, yeah. Really? Well, how do you feel about that? Oops. All right. And remember, if it's Monday... I work best without a net. It's off the menu. But the soul you save... May indeed, and in fact, be your own. See you next time. Good night, all. Be good. And remember, if it quacks like a duck, and it walks like a duck, and it swims like a duck, it may be a hippie at the, at the human being in Golden Gate Park. <laughs>